I'd like to start by asking you, Dominic, why you chose to seek election to the Dexu Select Committee. Well, look, I think whether you're a Leave or a Remainer, we want to see the choices set out very clearly for Parliament and for the British public. And um, I'm certainly looking forward to playing my role in that. And the committee is going to be absolutely crucial to that. It's cross-party, represents all parts of the UK, represents all conceivable viewpoints on uh, from, from both within the Leave and Remain camps, but also obviously across those divides. And so actually it's a very important committee, really important for the public, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Okay. What do you feel the committee's first priority in its work should be? Well, I don't want to prejudice what we decide, but I think obviously what people are building up towards will be the triggering of Article 50 and what's the government's game plan. So amongst the other things that we'll look at, I think that's going to be uh, part of it, which is what is it we actually want to achieve? Mm -hmm. How will you be using your role on the committee to hold the government to account on the Brexit process? Well, I guess there are two fundamental things that the committee will do. One is to scrutinise witnesses and look at the evidence very carefully, and that will include government ministers. Um, and the second thing will be to provide reports, which can, I guess, look at what the facts are, what's the trade-off on trade or on security, and what are the options available. So in both of those ways, I think the committee will have a, an important role. How do you feel the government's position of not offering what it calls a running commentary on the process will com be compatible with parliamentary scrutiny? Well, I guess it's about finding the right balance. Um, there's no indiscreet questions in politics, only indiscreet answers. So I think we can ask whatever we like. We can really try and get down to the bottom of what's going on. And I think the government will understandably if you've had any uh, involvement in negotiations, want to keep its cards relatively close to its chest. But I guess only until we begin the negotiations in terms of what its initial position will be. And then there's going to be, I think, at the point at which we trigger Article 50, a clearer explanation of what the government's position will be. And that will come around quite quickly. What does making a success of Brexit look like for you? Two things. Delivering on the verdict in the referendum to take back control of our laws, our money and our borders. Um, and secondly, if I had one other goal, it was to halve the 48%, so that when we get round to the next general election, we have r scaled back the number of people that are opposed to the course we're taking. I'm not saying that people need to say, well, do you know what, if we'd, if we'd have had our time again, we'd have voted leave, but I think to assuage the concerns and mitigate the risks, that's going to be crucial. How do you think the Department for Exiting the European Union is doing so far in its work? Well, I think it's doing pretty well. I mean, look. David Davis went in there um, with a new team, had to recruit the civil servants from scratch, put together a strategy, um, engage in the preliminary consultation exercise. And I actually think for all the brickbats anyone would get doing that job, we've got a clear time frame subject to the High Court ruling, but I think even notwithstanding that, we're going to start the negotiations by March. I think there's quite clear what we're not going to do. We're not going to trade control over immigration in order to try and get a better terms. We don't need to do that. And um, we're ambitious to make sure that whilst we're leaving the EU, we remain a good European neighbour for trade, for security and for lots of other things. So I appreciate there'll be, there's a sort of Goldilocks critique that he will get, which is he's not doing, you know, he's not going hot enough, he's not, you know, he's going too cold or he's not, you know, he's too soft or he's too hard. Um, but actually, I think he's approached it and the government as a whole has approached it in a pretty sensible way. Mm. You're a member of a 21 member select committee here. Yes. Does the size of that body risk becoming what the Institute for Government has termed a toothless watchdog in the Brexit process? Well there must be a risk of that um, and I think there's a responsibility not just on the chair who's very mindful of it and I, you know I like Hilary Benn and the fact that he was a Remainer doesn't really bother me um, because he's got to steer this committee through and I think try and find where the balance of a consensus can be. Committees are much more authoritative and much more credible when they can command a consensus. So and I think all the individual members from our first meeting that we've already had last week are mindful that we actually want to get things done. And the truth is even if you're a Brexiter, even if you're a Leaver like me, I still want to hold the government to account and I want to be very clear on what the choices are and I want to do that because I'm a public servant first and a party polit politician second. Mm. Um, what do you feel the committee can offer that perhaps other select committees can't? Because there's a lot of work going on at the moment about the Brexit process in other parts of Parliament, but this is a new committee set up just to examine the actual work of leaving. Well, I guess it will be focused on the Brexit negotiations and on the Brexit department in a way that the others will be spread more thinly. It can bring together some of that work and it can look at 
I suppose, Brexit as a strategy and um, the negotiation as a specific process. So we'll do that job, but you know, other committees will have expertise they can bring. Which do you feel is the more important task for the committee, to contribute to the negotiating process or to scrutinise them? Well, I think they actually both um, feed off each other and reinforce each other. I think scrutinising what the government's doing is the most important thing, but of course by teasing out the choices and the trade-offs, um, I think we'll play an important and influential role in terms of helping shape the agenda. You've spoken about the importance of building a consensus here between members of the committee. Is it difficult, you feel, to bridge the dividing line between the Remain supporting members and the Leave supporting members of the committee at the moment? Well, the truth is, first of all, that the politicians, myself included, need to move on from the referendum. There's, I, th I feel that there's something akin to post-traumatic stress disorder from the referendum. When everyone hears the words EU, the politicians go back into the trench warfare, the grenades go off, the, sh the, 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 the stun grenades let off uh, shattering light beams which, uh, <laughs> which paralyse us all. We need to move on from that. It was a very polarising and divisive debate. I was in the heat of it, I saw it, I felt it, and now we need to move on to something a bit more sober and a bit more constructive. And if you're a lever, that means listening to the concerns of the Remainers and managing down the risks and I guess if you're a Remainer it must mean accepting the result and trying to team up with people like me to make it work because in the end of the day we all want the best deal for Britain so actually I'm an eternal optimist I think from my initial sense of the committee there's a reasonable chance that we'll actually put that party politics to one side and understand that scrutinising the government is something that's in everyone's interest. And finally, how should the government respond to the High Court ruling that parliamentary approval must be sought for triggering the Article 50 process? Well, I think they're right to appeal to the Supreme Court because it was totally unprecedented and I think um, certainly as a former lawyer I can see why um, we would want to challenge some of the legal grounds. This isn't about knocking the judges. Um, I've made clear, uh, the government's made clear that if the Supreme Court uphold it, um, we may, you know, we will, we will need to um, uh, implement it. And I guess given the High Court ruling, the government will start preparing for that. Um, I, I think that the opponents of Brexit, the die-hard Remainers, need to understand one thing though, and this is absolutely crystal clear. I don't, for example, support hard Brexit, which is leaving the EU without having got a trade deal in place. And we ought to try and use the two years of the Article 50 process to secure that. The more that the Remain side or the people that are opposed to Brexit try and tie the government up with conditions and fetters, the less likely it is we'll get a deal within that two years, and therefore the more likely it is that we'd end up with a hard Brexit. And that is, if you like, the irony, or you could say the perversity of the position that the Liberal Democrats have got themselves into. Funnily enough, I can see already that Labour in a very different position. I think they're very conscious of that. So there's going to be pressure on the government, but there's also pressure on the different bits and the different parties in Parliament and individual MPs to be responsible about this. Otherwise particularly those on the Remain side, could end up being responsible for a hard Brexit. And that's not what I want. And I think that's not what most of the country, particularly those that are just nervous and anxious about the risks, want to see.